Hi everyone, this is Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein and together with ChessLecture.com I'd like to welcome you to today's video. Today I want to present to you a very important concept in chess which I hope many of you have heard or seen examples. This is called the Philidor Ring and if you've never heard of this expression before, it's named after the first greatest chess player, Andre Philidor, who came up with this concept. And actually, Pillsbury, um, who is also a renowned chess player, has used it in a lot of his games and he won a bunch of them. So let me show you what I mean. So in this game, I'm playing white and my opponent tries to go into the slough, which I welcome because after d5 I would like to try this exchange slot line that I've used pretty successfully over the years this move knight c3, knight f6, bishop g5 well what's the point of this move bishop g5? immediately this is very uncomfortable for black some people don't like double pawns so my opponent plays e6 and I have faced this move many many times and I love it when my opponent locks the bishop on e6. These pawns are locking the bishop and it's not obvious how the bishop is free. So what is white's plan in these structures? Well this is a perfect example to use the Philidor ring concept. e3, knight c6, here I can already start building the ring with f4. Basically it's two pawns supporting the piece, usually a knight followed by knight of 3 knight e5, but first things first I decided to develop my pieces knight of 3 castles, castles, a6, rook c1, keep in mind without that bishop black has zero counterplay bishop d7, and now that I've activated all my pieces this is perfect timing to set up the Philidor ring knight e5, notice that taking on e5 is not recommended after pawn takes this knight really has no good squares and playing knight e8 looks simply bad. So that's why my opponent goes and plays rook c8. He, she is actually, it's a female, she is from Cuba and she prefers to play this position, knight takes d7. This is such a monster knight, such a bad bishop. And now if this happens I have no advantage whatsoever. Major pieces will get traded probably in the c file. The position is dead equal. There is no way white can play for a win. So very important moment here. Let's go back and that's why I finally execute the concept. F4 X clam. This is the Philidor ring. Two side pawns support the piece uh, in front of them, usually the knight. This specific instance you can actually get from many different openings. You can get it from the London system, from the Tory attack. Pillsbury played it all the time and I'm sure you understand how dangerous and powerful this knight on e5 really is. And what's really tough about this position for black is that black doesn't have any counterplay whatsoever. So let's say what happens next. h6, I simply play bishop h4. The pressure is simply too strong. In the future I may play king h1, possibly queen f3, rook g1 and just store with the g-pawn and get to the enemy king. The center is fully closed which allows me this action on the king side. Knight takes e5. Well this is somewhat of a concession because I'm gonna get a favorable structure but I can definitely understand black. She was not comfortable with the knight sitting on e5. Pawn takes knight e8 and simply bishop to g3. Now this is the consequences of the field of ring. Usually one of the pawns ends up on e5. Here I prefer the f pawn to open up the half open file. The knight is totally cut out from the game and black still has zero counterplay because of the terrible bishop on d7. So bishop g5, bishop f4, I don't mind the trade my bad bishop. Takes, takes and believe it or not even though we started the opening as a sort of classical Slav exchange variation we actually got into French. This move, this rather structure is very reminiscent of the French and of course the plan here is to recall good old Nimzovich 
and to break through with the pawn chain f5, a timely f5 would really cause black a lot of damage. So she played f5 herself. She's a good player, and she doesn't want to deal with my f5 push at all. So the question is what to do now? And this is very instructive. Now, the tactical part of the game is sort of over, right? This is now a positional game. The center is locked down. These pawns are much worse than these pawns because the bishop is light square bishop and this guy is stuck. But because the position remains closed, the question is how can white break through? And here, to give you guys a hint, the major part of white's plan is going to revolve around attacking the enemy king with the timely g4 push while using the queen side and specifically the c-file to try to win the battle on both sides of the board. So now the, man the maneuvering game begins. Queen d2 connecting the rooks, b5. All right, I'm not afraid of b4. I'm just going to play knight e2, no big deal. Bishop c6. Notice that black strategy is containment. This is a wall. The bishop is kind of like a pawn, but the wall is to stop me from getting anywhere in this position. Well, here I spot a second way to create the field or ring. Let's see if you can spot it. Where can I create the field or ring? That's right, c5 square. If you said c5, you are correct. I can mount my knight on c5 after a very nice knight c1, b3, c5 idea. Or I decided, well, my rook can't really be attacked. Why not rook on c5? And really try to put pressure on the c file. Queen b6, b4. Yet again, another example of Philodoring, except this time it's the rook on c5. It's not so easy for black to do anything at all here. Rook f7, h3. Notice that now that I've secured the queen side, I'm hinting to my opponent. I still have kingside counterplay, whereas black just has to patiently sit back and wait for my attack. Double up, king h2, king h7, and now I was thinking about playing g4, but I decided I'm not in a hurry. I always have that as an option. I really want to hint to black that this pressure is very much annoying. Bishop d7, and guys, this is very important. Don't trade the rooks. This is a huge release of pressure. If you do this, your advantage is completely gone. It's not so easy to win anymore. It's going to be quite a challenge to drag the knight on c5 and then start to open up the enemy king. Still white is better, but the, with the rooks it's so much more powerful. So let's go back to the game. Now the power of the field or ring is pretty obvious. After the move rook c2, I'm sort of saying, you know what, I'm playing a waiting game. I'm never afraid of rook take c5 because I'm going to take with a z-pawn, create the protected pass pawn with a beautiful blockading outpost. This should be easy victory. And this is one of the most important lessons you should learn. If you don't see a clear way how to break through your opponent's defenses, make a useful move. Put some pressure on them. So now this is an idea and this is an idea. The knight's coming to b3 followed by coming to c5 or even a5. The position is really not pleasant at all. So black plays rook a8 and here I take the opportunity and realize, aha, this is perfect time to start the king's side storm. g4, g6, and now pawn takes, pawn takes, knight g3. Look at that. The knight's heading to h5 and f6, and this knight is sort of overloaded, protecting both the square and the rook. So here black, after a long thought, decided, okay, I need to really dig in, so I'm going to trade on c5. Pawn takes, this is exactly what I try to accomplish. Queen d8. And now, the logical move knight h5 doesn't make a lot of sense anymore. Because queen's coming to h4, putting pressure on my knight, my king is a little bit weak, and really this is not something I was comfortable with. Maybe it's playable, but why? I decided to switch gears again. Notice how I'm going back and forth, back and forth. Now that I've created the protected passer, the knight has a perfect outpost, the defensive blockade and outpost on d4. Knight e2. Queen h4, knight d4, knight g7, and queen f2. Now the end game is going to be totally winning for white. How would white win this kind of end game? Well, obviously the c pawn is not going to be sufficient enough to win the game. After the queens get traded off, 
The real danger is this pawn. So at the right moment, I'm going to play this fold by a4, come up, take the pawn and break through with b5 or win the a pawn all together. Black is utterly hopeless. So that's why she decides to keep the queens on the board. Queen e7 and simply a3. Once again, showing that I'm not in a hurry, I'm going to protect my b pawn prior to pushing the c pawn. Rook g8, there's really no danger. c6, bishop e8, and now rook c5. This is another important move. I'm leaving the square for my queen, so when I'm ready to push, the queen could come and help out. Bishop f7, here comes the pawn, and here black played queen d7. And I have a question for everybody. What would you play against the natural move rook c8? Here there's a beautiful tactical idea. Let's see if you can find it. So I had in mind a really cool idea. Again, if you need more time, go ahead and stop the video. All right, after you pause the video, here is the move. Knight c6, x clan. Queen takes, and now what's the tactic, guys? Look at the rook, look at the queen, look at my rook on c5. Yep, it's the knight jump. So pick your favorite square, e7 or a7. a7 would be wrong. That's right, because you are pinned. Terrible move, but this is the right move. And now white is going to win material and the game. So this is what I had in mind. Now, what if, let's say, black doesn't take, after knight c6, doesn't take the pawn. Let's say queen d7. In that case, I had a very cute knight maneuver. Knight b8 here to the queen. Queen back, knight here. This pawn has fallen and the game is over. So that's why my opponent played queen d7. So how does white win? Well, I kind of show you the main idea, right? We have to break through the queen side and this is the key weakness. So how do we do that? A4, that's right. A4 is the winning move. If pawn takes, bishop takes, a6 wins. So rook c8 was played, simple move takes, takes, and now c7 pawn is hanging, so queen c2 does the job. Notice that just in case, I also keep an eye on the f pawn. If knight gets to h5, knight takes f5, simply wins the game. So black is in big trouble. After a while, she realized this is just game over and resigned. Honestly, there is no defense. If knight e8, I can do many different ways to win. Bishop b5 obviously wins. I kind of like this more. And again, the game is won on both sides of the board. So the lesson for everybody is remember the Philidor ring. Very nice idea. Both an aggressive idea with the knight on e5, supporting the, by the pawns d4 and f4. And the positional idea with the rook on c5, supported by the pawns b4 and d4. In both cases, white got a superior position Black had no counterplay and white converted to win. So I want you to practice these ideas in your own games and share with me your beautiful victories. Thank you very much. This was Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein for ChessLecture.com. Goodbye.